Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the start of the afternoon session. I understand it's been quite successful all morning. I'm Gwen Dawson, the Senior Vice President of Design and Construction for the Battery Park City Authority. I met Heather Morgan in 2018 and had the pleasure of working closely with her for the next three years in her role as Director of Climate Risk Adaptation for AECOM and is part of the AECOM team that designed the South Battery Park City Resiliency Project, which, by the way, you can see under construction right outside this building. This project, which when completed next year, will provide flood risk reduction for parts of Battery Park City, including the museum, and for additional parts of Lower Manhattan. Trained in landscape architecture and landscape archaeology, Heather was profoundly serious about her work in climate risk adaptation. But refreshingly and surprisingly, she did not take herself overly seriously. Her incredible analytical talents, keen insights, and extraordinary communication skills are rarely seen coupled with the level of generosity of spirit, kindness, humility, and gratitude that were on full display at all times with Heather. She cared deeply and authentically and considered it her responsibility to do whatever she could to make the world better and the people in her orbit a little happier. She wildly succeeded on both counts as evidenced by her professional accomplishments and the tremendous lasting impacts she's had on the people who encountered her. One of the many mental images of Heather that stays with me is remembering how she would tackle a tough technical question from an attendee at a community meeting and her insistence on making sure that the answer to the question was fully understood and appreciated no matter how long it took. She frequently ended her sentences with the question, does that make sense? Usually, the answer was yes, because she was so good at explaining things. But if the answer was no, she would back up and try approaching it a different way until she got a yes. Needless to say, even though our meetings were successful, they sometimes went a little long. <laughs> Such was her dedication to creating a broad base of understanding of climate risk issues. In appreciation of her contributions to Battery Park City, New York City, and the cause of climate risk adaptation. It remains Battery Park City Authority's pleasure to be a founding sponsor of the Heather M. Morgan Climate Adaptation Lecture. It is likewise my great pleasure and honor to introduce this year's speaker, Lorian Farrell, the Deputy Commissioner of the Bureau of Coastal Resiliency for the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. I can think of no one more well suited to deliver today's address. Lorian is a water resources engineer with a master's degree in landscape architecture who, prior to coming to New York City, worked as the senior manager for flood risk management and infrastructure at the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, and then as the senior manager for the environment at the city of Brampton, Ontario. Lauren came to the United States in 2019 to join the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities Network, where she served as Global Director of Knowledge Transformation and Regional Director for North America. In October 2023, Lorian was appointed as the first Deputy Commissioner of the newly formed Bureau of Coastal Resiliency at the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, where she has undertaken the monumental task of coordinating all of the city's coastal resilience efforts and projects for the 520 miles of New York City shoreline, an incredibly challenging and also an incredibly important task. I met Lorian just a couple of months ago in the context of Battery Park City Authority's ongoing coordination with New York City and New York City Department of Environmental Protection on both our South Battery Park City Resiliency Project and our Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Project, which is currently in design. During this brief time, I've been delighted to find in her someone who is extremely thoughtful, approachable, insightful, and down to earth. She is obviously well equipped for and enthusiastic about taking on the management and oversight of this far reaching coastal resiliency program. By all accounts, she is a master collaborator. 
Speaking for my colleagues and myself, we are excited about working with her and her team and hearing her remarks today. Please join me in welcoming Lorian Farrell. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Gwen, for the kind introduction. Uh, and thank you very much to Waterfront Alliance and the conference organizers for inviting me here today to, uh, to, honor, to be a part of honoring Heather Morgan's legacy. And, and thank you for uplifting women in this climate space uh, with this lecture series. <laughs> I was deeply touched uh, and excited to discuss my plans for this new Bureau of Coastal Resilience. And, and you are all well versed in the climate data projections. In this region, we are expected to experience up to a 25% increase in annual rainfall in 2100. Sea level rise may be as high as 5.5 feet. We expect more intense hurricanes. <clears throat> and and another terrifying fact that I learned from the Army Corps of Engineers recently is that if we had an eight-foot storm surge today, that exact same storm in 2100 would create a nine-foot storm surge because of sea level rise. And that nine foot would be on top of the 2100 sea level. That's incredible. But look, we don't have to wait for the future to be impacted by climate change. Multiple forecasters, forecasters have indicated <clears throat> that this hurricane season is expected to be more severe than average, and these are the hard truths. The creation of the new Bureau of Coastal Resilience, BCR, was a major initiative announced in the Plan NYC uh, plan, getting sustainability done by the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice in April 2023. It's a brand new bureau that is tasked with providing response to the risks of coastal flooding from sea level rise, tidal flooding, and storm surge. All across this region, there's been a tremendous amount of work done to respond to the devastating impacts of Tropical Storm Sandy. But now, we need to face forward and decide what the next era of coastal resilience needs to look like to ensure that our cities are resilient and that no one is left behind. As of now, more than a dozen projects are underway in New York City, but none is complete and fully functional. The reality is that this year, if a storm surge hits New York City, there will be flooding. Fortunately, New Yorkers are better protected today than 12 years ago today, with improvements in the, to the MTA, our power system, and NYCHA. The disruption in most cases would be for hours or a day or two instead of months. Part of my work over the past seven months since I took on this position has been to talk, about, talk to as many of my city colleagues as possible and to talk to as many community-based organizations, advocates, and whoever, whoever would, I could corner to help me understand what we need to do next as a city. I cannot count how many people said to me, boy, you must be really brave, or good luck to you, you're going to need it. <laughs> and. Uh, they don't say this in jest, actually. <laughs> my favorite reaction, though, my favorite reaction is, we've been waiting for you. We've got you. People are genuinely worried about me, but also incredibly supportive. And have you ever had that feeling that you're in the right place at the right time? It's an amazing feeling. And I'm in the right place, and I feel really I feel really grounded in knowing that although my task is huge, I am not alone in this work. But mark my words, this challenge we face is going to make us all into adaptive leaders. I want to talk about adaptive leadership as our pathway to success. I also want to talk about equity and urban resilience. So after Tropical Storm Sandy hit the coastline in 2012, the city received $15 billion in federal funding for the planning, design, and construction of coastal flood protection assets. The, de the Department of Design and Construction and Economic Development Corporation have been incredibly hard at work constructing many of these assets, the first of which are coming online this summer as the floodgates along the east side of Manhattan get handed over to BCR. By 2026, Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project, 
the Brooklyn Bridge Montgomery Coastal Resiliency Project and the Battery Coastal Resiliency Project will all be online. In 2028, Red Hook, the South Shore of Staten Island's Army Corps project, and the seaport are all scheduled for completion. And I cannot under, understate what an incredible achievement this is. And I applaud all of you who have worked on these plans. And I applaud members of the communities who came out and participated in processes and let your needs be heard. This work takes a long time. And the pace is frustrating to many, but we are designing complex systems in the densely urban area, and the reality is that we need to take our time and get it right. We also need to learn from the efforts of the past 12 years and build upon those lessons, because as Maya Angelou said, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. So why the new bureau? We need a unified New York City vision for coastal resilience. Now that we are coming to the end of the planning, for Sandy response, what's next? What about the areas that were not impacted by Hurricane Sandy, but are still vulnerable? We need to develop a strategy for sea level rise and for the daily tidal flooding that some are already experiencing today. We will coordinate efforts across city agencies so that we can be more effective and efficient as a whole. And if you count up all the planned assets we are gonna have to maintain and operate, we get 32 swing and roller gates, 93 flip-up gates, 2.5 miles of flood wall, five interceptor gates, 50 new tide gates, nine sluice gates, and a bunch of pump stations. Um, this doesn't include all of the future projects, of course. And BCR will be the operating agency for these, for these assets. We need to maintain them in a state of good repair on sunny days and get out and close the flood defense systems in advance of extreme weather. BCR is now the go-to agency for coastal resilience and will provide the citywide leadership for coastal resilience that is needed. And as I said, we need to be looking forward now. What relationship are we going to have with the coastline in 2100 and in 2150? How do we meet the urgency of now while planning for an uncertain future? How can we utilize the United States Army Corps of Engineers HATS opportunity for, reg re for regional success. And to be successful, the Bureau needs to be holistic and forward-thinking and equitable. We need to take a living with water and a one water approach because we know that sea level rise, tidal flooding, and coastal storm surge are not the only types of flooding that affecting people in this region. We need to work together with our counterparts at DEP and think of the whole of water system. We need to find new mechanisms of innovative funding and financing and enabling legislation. And we need to be collaborative, both internally and externally. This is probably the most important thing that we can do. So Heather Morgan's life and work resonate deeply with me. When I started to learn more about Heather, about who she was as a person and a practitioner, and realized how much we had in common, it gave me pause. This lecture feels personal to me. And so I thought I'd share some of the experience that shaped how I think we need to approach this work. Like Heather, I have a background in flood risk management. I spent over a decade at the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, leading the flood forecasting and warning program for the greater Toronto area. I realized that despite becoming well-versed in the technical work of flood models and flood mapping and emergency management plans, um, I generally lacked an understanding of the people that we were trying to protect. If you ask me about the lived experiences of the communities, their hopes and their dreams, I would have been hard pressed to come up with an answer that didn't just reflect my own experiences and what I thought people should be dreaming and hoping for. Once I realized that I needed to focus on the people to be a better engineer, I discovered the concept of holistic urban resilience and the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities Network. And now that program shuttered in 2019, but before that happened, I learned how to shift my approach from a purely technical one to one that incorporates a deeper understanding of human and community factors in urban resilience. By holistic, I mean all of the factors that help a person, a community, or a city survive, adapt, and thrive despite any of the shocks and stresses that they may face. So, 
our challenge is absolutely not about keeping water out. It's about understanding what happens when we can't keep all of the water out and putting in place the systems and services that people need to live their best lives. At 100 RC, during my first in-city trip to Calgary, I also shifted my perspective about community engagement. Before, I used to discuss with my colleagues how much more we could achieve if we could just get the public to trust us. Though my work in resilience, uh, through my work in resilience, I realized the problem was not how do they trust us, rather how do we trust them. This was a profound change for me. Uh, maybe not for all of you. For some of you, you've been thinking this for a long, long time. Um, but I realized that even if the solutions that were put forward weren't necessarily technically feasible, there was usually some nugget of information in the idea or in the ideas that led to the idea that could catalyze solutions that worked for the community. We have a huge opportunity to influence our coastline over the next several years with the United, Store, the United States Army Corps of Engineers, New York, New Jersey, Harbor and Tributary Study hats. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, that's a $52 billion coastal storm risk management program by the Army Corps in partnership with our non-federal sponsors, New Jersey State and New York State, along with New York City as a local partner. And this is gonna shape our coastline of our entire region for generations to come. One of my goals for BCR is to ramp up community engagement. I think it's very important that the city teams up with our regional partners to implement a robust community engagement plan to talk about HATS over the next two, four, and six years as a tentatively selective plan details are further developed. This way, when the Army Corps goes to Congress for authorization to design and for the appropriation of funds, they would do so with the powerful backing of communities. Of course, the coastline is not just for people. It's an ecosystem, and that in, in and of itself is a tremendous value. Having worked in the environmental field for so long, I understand that if the regulatory and political system tells you something that you value isn't all that valuable, then you should change the system. This is something that advocates in New York City are great at, and it's gonna take all of us working together, pulling all of the levers available to us to create the coastline we need. And I recognize that this is a long game. So there's one more important thing that I shared, that I shared with Heather, and that was a cancer diagnosis. That's right, so I'm gonna get a little personal now. I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma when I was 27. That was 27 years ago. And for those of you doing the math right now, please stop. <laughs> it's entirely, entirely not necessary. Um, but back then, I was in the middle of my master's degree uh, in landscape architecture. I had six months of chemotherapy, followed by radiation. I lost too much weight and all of my hair. I want to make this time with you today personal. Because let's face it, we don't talk enough about the fact that we show up to work each day as whole people just trying to make this place better. Our personal challenges don't sit at home waiting for us to finish our work. We have to protect each other because this work in this field is so hard. My mom knew I had cancer one week before I got the call. She's a retired obstetrical nurse and I don't know if you guys have nurses in your family, they have a way of figuring out things they're not supposed to know. And and I don't know what she did during those seven days between my biopsy and when we got the lab results, when she was alone with her thoughts. But when she was with me, she was laser focused on one mission, to, pre to prepare me for the hard truth that was about to come. She played out positive and negative scenarios for me. If it's this, then we do that. If it's that, then we're gonna do this. Either way, she said, we're making some changes starting today. We're gonna to get to eat healthier. Don't stress, she said. No matter what comes our way, we have a plan and we'll get through this together. This year, the Waterfront Conference's mission, how we all get there together, is the theme of this talk. So let's work on this plan. I've shared this part of my deeply personal story because the plan won't work unless we get personal. We are beyond talking about lines on maps or degrees or of temperature increases. We are talking about people's lives. 
all aspects of their lives. We need to get back to that sense of urgency that we all felt after Tropical Storm Sandy hit the city, causing the loss of 44 lives. And yes, an incredible amount of damages too, and not to mention the mental health impacts that we, we don't discuss often enough. Our plan for coastal resilience must center equity. Many of us didn't study equity in our technical training, but now we understand systemic inequities and their impacts. Ibram Kendi's 2019 book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, highlights that combating racism requires changing policies and structures, not just attitudes. The root of racism is not ignorance or hate, it is power. So anti-racism involves shifting power and actively challenging racist policies through political action, education, and community organizing. Equity must be at the core of our decision-making processes, not just a topic of endless discussion and empty mission statements. One thing I know for sure from my readings and from my, experiencing, my experiences working with cities around the world is that without equity, cities will never be resilient. And it struck me when I was working with chief resilience officers that the challenge we have isn't a technical one. It's a leadership challenge. Because our problems are extremely complex, they require complex solutions. And that doesn't fit well into the city budget, planning, and political cycles. <clears throat> and I really like the adaptive leadership approach, which was developed by a team at Harvard led by Ron Heifetz. When I came across this in my reading, I realized that it's a framework that could be applied to cities that we aren't talking about. Adaptive leader leadership distinguishes between technical problems, which can be solved with existing know-how, and adaptive challenges, which require new learning and changes in values, beliefs, roles, relationships, and approaches. Coastal resilience poses an adaptive, adaptive challenge. Adaptive, le adaptive leaders regulate distress. They keep the pressure on to encourage adaptation without overwhelming the organization. This involves managing the amount of stress to ensure it's, it is sufficient to catalyze change, but not so much that it leads to chaos or burnout. Coastal resilience in this new era requires a vision for our coastline, a plan to get there, and a place that brings everyone along. Adaptive leaders encourage people at all levels to take responsibility for the changes needed, give them ownership, and value voices who bring up uncomfortable truths. When you're an adaptive leader, you recognize the emotional and physical toll that leading adaptive change can take, and you take steps to maintain your well-being and your resilience. There are more principles to this theory, but I like these ones the best. Moreover, adaptive leaders must be aware of four ways people will try to stop them because, surprise, surprise, people don't really like disruptive change, even when it will benefit them in the long run. So when you push the boundaries to solve complex challenges, you may find people trying to marginalize you, to overburden you with more work, to professionally discredit you, or the weirdest one, but one that I've definitely seen happen, they will seduce you by giving you a promotion and accolades. And so, and so not to risk losing your newfound status, you may just keep quiet. Well, recognizing this, these techniques to, de to derail your efforts helps you manage them more, more, more effectively. And so in closing, I wanna leave you with three key messages from my talk today. First, our approach to coastal resilience must be holistic, integrating technical solutions with a deep understanding of human and community needs. It's not just about keeping the water out, but ensuring that our communities have the systems and services they need to thrive. Second, equity must be at the heart of our resilience efforts. Without addressing systemic biases and discrimination, we cannot fully, truly build resilient cities. Each of us has the power and the responsibility to push for these changes. Third, adaptive leadership is essential for navigating the complex challenges of coastal resilience. By embracing adaptive strategies, we can foster innovation, empower our communities, and maintain a clear vision for a sustainable future. And finally, taking a cue from my brilliant mom, my first adaptive leader, I will leave you with this. We need to prepare our communities in New York City and the region for the hard truth, hard truth that is about to come. We should play out positive and negative scenarios. If it's this, then we're gonna do that. And if it's that, then we're gonna do this. And 
Either way, we need to start making some changes so that no matter what comes our way, we have a solid and adaptable plan. We'll get through this together. Thank you for being here with me today. Thank you for all of your support. And I look forward to working closely with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Please sit, please sit. Oh, this is one, so lovely. <laughs> Look at the support. I, I feel really blessed to be here and honored. Um, I have a bit of time for a few questions, if anybody would like to uh, any, ask any burning questions. There is a microphone um, going around the room with Ben here. So if you would just raise your hand. And I'm going to grab a bit of water. Hi, I'm Kelly. Um, I just graduated last year from Mount Holyoke. Um, I'm a waterfront scholar. Um, thank you for your talk. I wanted to ask, thinking about community when making decisions for them, like you said something about that, um, about thinking about community when, uh, when making decisions for them, yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, what strategies do you use to make impactful decisions for community members um, while, like, while also like taking in consideration like their experiences? Kelly? Ke yeah, thank you, Kelly, for your question. Um, I think that the thing is about, so in my experience, which was really old school community engagement, <laughs> where you did your two community meetings and you checked the box on your, on your requirements, all you had to do was just show up, and even if nobody came to the meeting, you were, you were successful, right? And I think the new way of doing this work, and many of you in the room have been advocating this and doing this for so many years, is to make sure when you're designing your programs that you put the budget in place and the time that's required to do authentic community engagement, which means you go to the places where the communities are you don't expect them to come down to City Hall for meetings at in inconvenient times. Um, you, you show up, you make it as easy for people to give their, uh, their information or their ideas uh, as you can. You provide daycare, you provide food. If you can figure it out in your budget, you pay people for their time. I, in Tulsa, the Chief Resilience Officer there shared with us that they pay their community members who are contributing consultant rates to show up and to provide information. Everybody gasped. <laughs> but why not? They're experts in their fields. Yeah. So, um, you know, we have a big shift to do in terms of making sure that we can get the budgets and the timing into our systems that will allow us to do the authentic work. But I think that's, those are some of the things that I'm striving to do. And I can't see. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, hi, this is uh, Bob Acker with Arup. I was wondering, this, this is a relatively new position for New York City. I mean, you kind of just answered it from referencing Tulsa, but there are a lot of other communities out there that have been doing this kind of coastal resilience um, management from a city-wide or municipal-wide uh, level. Is, new York, is part of moving forward together, are we talking to these communities and learning from what they've done over the last decade or more in some instances? Absolutely. And I, I will say, this is new, it's a new bureau for the city of New York, but the work has been ongoing for, in New York City for decades, just spread across a number of agencies and really um, spearheaded by the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice and previously the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resilience. Um, and so what is new about this work now is really the, the turn toward looking toward the future as opposed to a response from Sandy, and then also the need to take on the operations of these new assets. And so it made sense to have this, this responsibility fall into an operating bureau like DEP. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, 100% yes. We have been talking to many coastal cities uh, around the country and internationally as well. Um, we regularly speak with Miami and Norfolk and Sandy, um, San Francisco and uh, 
we're all learning from each other. We're all learning about the latest techniques, uh, the, the regulatory challenges, the funding challenges, and we're also coordinating um, co or having conversations with the teams in Singapore and the UK. And so, yeah, there's, there's so much to learn from, from everybody. Um, <laughs> the Dutch, I didn't even mention the Dutch, of course. Uh, so, yes, that's one of the most fun parts of my work, actually. Ben, down in the front, we have a couple of hands up. Uh, thank you for your words. Uh, I think uh, this is my first time seeing you, and I'm very happy to see you up here, and we really appreciate your words. Um, my name's Clyde. I'm with an uh, architecture engineering firm called STV, but formerly New York City Housing Authority. Um, and paying the residents for their input uh, and engagement is uh, something that uh, we've deployed before and I think is a very, very um, important step in getting people out to lend their insights. Uh, one question I have for you is with the new establishment of this bureau, I'm curious about what kind of, you know, for you to be introducing new assets of resiliency to the city, um, it sounds like you're also adopting assets from previous agencies and previous projects as well. And I'm curious of what kind of uh, gaps or what uh, data or information you think is most needed from these previous agencies in order to bring these assets and systems into a more cohesive and comprehensive uh, measures of resilience all across the coastlines? I think, I think that um, in terms of how do we make sure that we're more efficient and effective and as we take on assets and we have really great asset management, long-term asset management plans, and we make the best use of the funding that we have available, which is not a lot, um, <laughs> it's really important. I think data is so important. Um, and so one of the things is though, we're not really taking over assets from other agencies per se. These new flood protection infrastructure components that are being built a, a, along the east coast of Manhattan, the east side coastal resilience project, the Brooklyn Bridge Montgomery project, those are brand new. Um, and so we're taking those on as new owners of a brand new asset. The one thing that is we are inheriting though is um, some of the outfall and tide gate maintenance around the coastline. And fortunately for me, that's already a DEP function. It's part of the, you know, our, our, our water conveyance systems. And so we're working really closely internally to make sure that we have conveyed the right information, but also that we're using our staff time in a really efficient way. And so we're working through all of that right now. Uh, what, what, what's the maintenance plan gonna look like for all of these assets? But thank you for your question. Okay, back at the back, but I think there was one more question here in the front as well. And I, I lost Ben. <laughs> there we go. Um, I'll stay. Um, hi, my name is Carmen. I'm an urban planning student at Rutgers. Um, I really like your idea of trusting a community member, so I would like to know if you can clarify or speak more about that, because normally we think them trusting us, but I have a community engagement background, so I never had that thought of us trusting them. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example of why I had this, why the shift in thinking was so profound for me. Because when I was working at the Toronto Region Conservation Authority, my job was to, um, some of, part of my job was to design or lead projects for flood risk management. And there was one community member who was literally the bane of my existence. This man, <laughs> this man hounded me constantly and he had just enough knowledge to be dangerous about hydraulic modeling and, and hydrologic modeling and uh, he wasn't, he, it was not his, um, his expertise but he went and self-taught himself about models and he would come to me with, I've done these runs and, and there were so many mistakes in them and I was, that's not how you do modeling and ugh, why are you bothering me <laughs> with all of this? And it was just really, but the man was passionate and he did not for years, this man went and got himself appointed to our board so then he became my boss. <laughs> and still, you know, what was I going to do? I had to listen to him. But I just, just, it was just hard. It was hard for me as a poor, lowly civil servant to take time out of my busy, busy day to, to, to really explain to him what the situation was. And unfortunately, there wasn't a great fix for his problem. And he was flooding biannually. Um, but one day after a severe weather event and there was a ton of flooding, um, 
I, I went, I left the office to go do media at 6, 6 a.m. and I didn't come back for two days because it was just such a bad flood and there was so much media and during those two days I went by his house just to see how he was doing and the look on his face and his, his whole affectation, his whole affect had changed. It, just the stress of this event again and again had just taken his toll on him and he took me through his house and, I, and that's when I started to realize like this is, this is not about my maps and my, my calculations of 2.5 people per household times a certain uh, technical value for the resource of their house, you know, that's the damages we're trying to avoid. This was about this man. And um, what I realized that he had been saying to me for a long time is all these plans you guys have aren't going to help us because we were designing to a city standard of, say, uh, 25 year storm return, return event for, for flood protection. And they were, it wasn't, it wasn't the right solution for that community. And he had been saying this for years. And so we were, we were going to invest all this money in, a, in a upgrading a pipe system that actually wasn't going to help them. So what he had in mind was something different. And so when we started to think, listen to him, and, and, and actually I lost that fight because well, I moved away. But, <laughs> but you know, it's really hard sometimes to get past the, um, the standards that a city has and then be able to see beyond that and listen to the community and when them saying these standards aren't the right ones for us. And so what I would hope we can do here is think about the solutions community by community. Um, standards are there for a reason and we can't ignore standards, but I think that when you really, really listen, and unfortunately it sometimes takes those, those, those Mike, his name is Mike, it takes those mics that just harass you before you, they weigh you down and you listen. Can we get to a point where we don't need to be worn down but we can make space for those conversations? I think that's important. I think, I don't know how much more time we have. My clock is at zero. Um, <laughs> anybody have the time? <laughs> I think we should cut it off, yeah. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for your great questions and for listening. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank so, thank you, Lorian. I um, was so excited to have you give this lecture today, and I hope that everyone else um, experiences that too, because you really, you and Heather do share so much, and you embody not only your disciplinary background with a foot in, in coastal flood risk management and landscape architecture, um, but you're, you know, as the conversation went, you're really welcoming, opening perspective, really helping bring everyone to the table. Um, because a deep, you know, understanding of the challenges we face, but also a real commitment to figuring out how to solve these problems from a bunch of different creative perspectives is really what it's going to take. And I think um, we look forward to your leadership at BCR. Um, and for those of you who didn't know Heather, I encourage you to, you know, read the, uh, the history of the lecture, read her bio, um, and really aspire to share those values in your own work and practice. So thank you again. Let's just give Lorian one more round of applause.